Hello, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the NextG Alliance. Uh, and the webinar title today is Societal, Economic, and Environmental Sustainability in 6G. Today's webinar is co-hosted by the SEN Working Group and the Green G Working Group from the NextG Alliance. I'm your moderator today, Sarah LaSalva, and for now I'm going to pass you off to Colleen Josephson, the Chair of the Societal and Economic Needs Working Group, and Bhushan Joshi, the Chair of the Green G Working Group. Uh, take it away, Colleen. Thanks, Sarah. Hello all and welcome to the Societal, Economic, and Environmental Sustainability in 6G webinar, uh, again presented by the Next G Alliance, Green G, and Societal and Economic Needs Working Groups. My name is Colleen. Uh, I am a senior research scientist at VMware, as well as an assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering at UC Santa Cruz. I currently uh, serve as the chair of the Societal and Economic Needs Working Group in the Addis Next G Alliance. I am also co-chair of the Green G Working Group. Next slide, please. The Next G Alliance uh, is a broad initiative that addresses the full wireless technology lifecycle from research to commercialization and engages with diverse ecosystems consisting of operators, vendors, hyperscalers, research groups, academia, and government. The Alliance has more than 80 members uh, and the, it, the number of organizations continues to grow. There are 37 founding members. Next slide, please. 54 contributing members. Next slide, please, once we have a moment to take that in. And five government members, including defense, standards, and public safety. The members collaborate across a diverse set of working groups working towards a North American vision and strategy for 6G and beyond. Next slide, please. The advent of modern information and communications technology, or ICT, has ushered in the so-called third industrial revolution and trans transformed the ways that our societies work, play, and interact. Once viewed as a novelty, internet access has become essential to our society's daily life. The ability to access the internet via mobile networks has demonstrated the potential to transform the social and economic prospects of people both in North America and around the world. This webinar will focus on the relationship between NextG technologies and three pillars of sustainability, social, economic, and environmental. In 1987, the United Nations defined sustainability as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Since then, experts have often divided sustainability into three primary pillars, social sustainability, economic sustainability, and environmental sustainability. Next slide, please. The NextG Alliance has two primary working groups focusing on the relationship between NextG and sustainability. Next slide, please. The Societal and Economic Needs Working Group explores social and economic sustainability. We've been working to identify and characterize NextG social and economic drivers and to make recommendations for how these factors should influence the next G prioritization for North American research, development, and deployment. The group is chaired by me, Colleen Josephson, and vice chaired by Mimi Tam of Ericsson and Jeremy Naser of Verizon. Next slide, please. For the past year, we've been working on our seminal white paper titled Beyond Speed, Promoting Social and Economic Opportunities Through 6G and Beyond. This report is currently in the final states of revision as, and is expected to be released within the next few weeks. It coalesces input from more than 45 industrial, academic, and government members, and it's a call to action for research, development, policies, and business models that promote the ubiquitous adoption of next-G technologies that are capable of progressing our vision for how next-generation communication networks can serve as a transformational instrument that serves the societal and economic needs of all people. Next slide, please. Our approach to identify and prioritize the relevant social and economic issues is formed by environmental, social, and governments, or ESG, materiality assessments, and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, commonly abbreviated as SDGs. The SDGs were introduced in 2015 and have been adopted by all UN member states. These goals act as a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future. 
They cover 17 areas, spanning topics such, topics such as gender equality, marine conservation, economic growth, and global peace. A number of them are tied to mobile network uh, connectivity, either directly or indirectly. Next slide, please. During the working group's first year, we established a based inventory of social and economic issues grouped into common outcomes, digital equity, trust, sustainability, economic growth, and quality of life. In the next few slides, I'll spend some time defining these outcomes and discuss how they relate to NextG and North American priorities. Next slide, please. Digital equity is achieved when the following three conditions are true for each user. Financial affordability, physical accessibility, and geographic availability of network services. Digital equity is far from reality. As of 2021, 83% of the world has access to mobile broadband. Wired broadband lags that figure significantly. Less than 20% have access to wired broadband. We might think that a wealthy nation like the United States is immune to these challenges, but that's not the case. An astonishing 43% of low-income Americans lack access to broadband, be it wired or wireless. Systemic inequality like this can, can create rifts between different parts of the population, leading to unrest and even in some extreme cases, violence. Therefore, to ensure a safe and peaceful society, it's imperative that all of our citizens get equal access to the transformative power of technology. Next is trust. Looking forward, leaders in the 6G space are envisioning ultra immersive user experiences, experiences such as virtual reality, uh, XR, and even brain computer interfaces. Advances like smart surfaces could weave IoT devices throughout our homes and even as smart clothing or medical devices that are on or in our bodies. These devices inherently handle high sensitivity information that, if mishandled, would grant observers unprecedented insight into the behavior of North American citizens and institutions. Thus, NextG systems must be trusted by our governments, corporations, and civilian users to the greatest extent possible. Key components of trust include security. NextG must ensure that information is securely and reliably delivered between endpoints. The network itself must be secure against attacks and other unwanted uh, penetrations. Data privacy. The vast volume of personal data being generated and tracked introduces increasing privacy and ethical use concerns around what kind and quantity of information is being passed and to whom. At the intersection of security and privacy, one particularly concerning possibility is the ability to observe and manipulate users' information streams without authorization. When paired with highly immersive technology like VR, XR, or brain-machine interfaces, we're suddenly upon a future where it could be possible for bad actors to literally change how people perceive the world. Therefore, it's absolutely necessary to protect network integrity and ensure the privacy of user data. Finally, resiliency. NextG systems should be highly resistant to disruptions and operate in acceptably degraded modes if they are damaged by malicious attacks by humans or by natural disasters like fires or floods. A reliable and resilient network is essential for supporting national critical infrastructures. Next slide, please. Our next two pillars are sustainability and economic growth. Sustainability. Climate change has led to an increase in extreme weather events that endanger the life and livelihood of citizens. We've come to understand that technology has a considerable and growing impact on the world. The carbon footprint of the ICT industry is on par with that of the aviation industry by some estimates, and it's projected to grow significantly in the next decade if substantial preventative action is not taken. Thus, as we begin to design NextG, it must be inherently environmentally sustainable in a way that previous Gs have not been. Furthermore, it's desirable that NextG systems are not just climate neutral, but they're also enabling sustainable practices across other industries. My uh, colleague Bouchon will talk about this in much more detail during his portion of the introduction. Next is economic growth. NextG is expected to encourage economic growth by increasing productivity, innovation, efficiency, effectiveness, and creating new value propositions, business models, and market segments. One particularly interesting intersection re related to economic growth is the challenge of spectrum access. 
We've witnessed free and open access to unlicensed spectrum in the ISM band lead to groundbreaking technologies like Wi-Fi, ultra-wideband localization, low energy communication like BLE and Zigbee and more. However, different parts of the spectrum enable different applications. For example, millimeter wave spectrum is capable of achieving rapid data rates and high resolution sensing applications like gesture detection. This same range of spectrum is completely inadequate for other applications like agricultural sensing, which would rely on longer wavelengths for long distance propagation or even underground sensing. Therefore, to maximize economic growth and innovation while maintaining national security, we need a series of conversations between industry leaders, policymakers, and defense stakeholders. Next slide, please. Finally, quality of life. Next G will be important to improving quality of life in North America and its local communities, including for public health services like healthcare, education, safety and security, and maintenance of a happy and supportive environment. It could also support human rights, freedom, peace, and democratic values. As we look to enhance the quality of life via applications like telemedicine, remote education, and enhance public safety, we must maintain the balance between the benefits that these technologies provide and the vulnerabilities they could expose us to. Thus, quality of life is often strongly linked to other outcomes, such as economic growth and trust. This concludes our overview of how 6G could contribute towards achieving the outcomes of digital equity, trust, sustainability, economic growth, and quality of life. However, it must be noted that 6G and other Next-G technologies cannot alone accomplish these goals. It is also possible that 6G, if not developed carefully, could inhibit these goals. Therefore, the conversations that the industry is having now are critical. My experience chairing the Societal and Economic Needs Working Group has shown me that the relationship between Next-G and societal needs is a rich topic that demands national strategic efforts. Improved channels are needed between stakeholders throughout governments, industry, academia, and elsewhere. This will allow the necessary interdisciplinary collaborations in research and development, defining of required metrics, and support of market structures that will be required to make North America the leader in creating next-G technologies that support the outcomes of digital equity, trust, environmental sustainability, economic growth, and quality of life to the fullest extent possible. And at this point, we'll move on from uh, social and economic sustainability and transition our focus to a deeper dive on environmental sustainability. So I'm pleased to pass this over to Bhushan Joshi, chair of the Green G Working Group. Take it away, Bhushan. Thank you so much, Colleen. And, and you know, just as you pointed out, we rightfully pointed out, we truly live in a world today where the environmental impacts of climate change are being experienced in our communities right now. Um, according to NASA, the last nine years have been the warmest years on record since, and that's since we started keeping records. And 2022 was one of those years as well. Um, while it's clear to us that human activity is the cause of climate change, there's a lot that needs to be done in order to address this existential threat to humanity. Um, my name is Bhushan Joshi. I am the head of sustainability for Ericsson in North America, and I also serve as the chair of the Green G Working Group, along with uh, Colleen Josephson and Michaela, who are the vice chairs. Um, I wanted to kind of start by talking about the mission and the goal of the Green G Working Group. So the mission of the, work, uh, of the Green G Working Group is to help establish North America as a leader in environmental sustainability within the next, G, uh, next gen technologies or in 6G. Um, and our goal is to do what we can or, or, or you know, focus on making sure that environmental sustainability is integrated in, in the next G standards and how the global communications industry um, looks at 6G as well. The working group is currently focused on, on, on kind of four key topics. Um, the first thing that we're really trying to do is to, you know, figure out how energy consumption and environmental impacts in next G uh, or in 6G technology can be addressed or how can they be minimized. Um, we're trying to assess that, you know, environmental impacts are not limited to greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption, but there are also environmental impacts related to water, related to material use. So how do we assess the environmental impacts of our technology on, uh, on these factors? Um, we're trying to explore how 
renewable energy and ambient energy devices can be used to really help decarbonize the ICT sector, working hand in glove with energy efficiency measures. Um, we're also investigating uh, how the ICT sector can enable the decarbonization of other sectors and how can it help reduce the carbon footprint of other sectors. Um, ICT is an exponential technology in that sense, in being having the ability to use connectivity to enable other sectors to decarbonize. Um, so as as we as the Green G Working Group uh, is looking through this, you know we're, we're kind of looking at three key drivers. Um, so Maddie, if you go to the next slide. So there are three key drivers that we're looking at. Um, and, and these drivers are, are kind of three, right? The first one is environmental sustainability. Um, so climate science is clear. In order to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we need to cut emissions by half each decade and reach net zero before 2050. 2040 is preferable. Um, and the ICT industry has aligned behind the science, aligned behind a science-based pathway to reach net zero by 2050. And then when when Colleen went through the members of the Green G Working Group and the members of of NextG, uh, a fair portion of them have signed up to these science-based targets and are working towards, uh, you know, taking a very science-based approach to their sustainability and climate action strategies. Um, the ICT sector is unique. It, it, it accounts for about 1.4% of global greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and yet it has the uh, potential to enable up to 15% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by enabling other sectors to be more efficient. Smart factories, smart um, you know, connected vehicles, um, you know, grids that are more renewable, um, you know, those types of applications. Um, and, the, uh, and the potential with 6G needs to be even larger than 5G. So that's, um, you know, that's a, another trend. Circular economy is another trend that's driving um, the work of the Green G Working Group. You know, uh, the concept of circular economy is that we move towards an economic system where we design to minimize waste. We maximize the use of resources in which materials and, and, and products can be recycled and reused and put back into beneficial reuse rather than being discarded after use. So, you know, when we look at the amount of demand that the ICT sector needs to support with 6G and the, and the, um, and the expectations from coverage, uh, capacity and communication throughout the world um, and reaching environmental sustainability targets at the same time, uh, it's important that we start moving or adopting towards the circular economy principles, um, which really integrate environmental sustainability into all aspects of the product design, from manufacturing to how it's used and how it's how it's treated at its end of life. The second impact, the second driver is the societal driver. Um, you know, 95% of Gen Z own smartphones, and uh, about 90% of the same cohort believe that companies must help and act on, on social and environmental issues. So it's a, it's a societal expectation. Investors as well look at climate action and climate change as a material risk to their investments and expect companies and organizations to uh, take, take into account these risks and opportunities. Um, and, and, and really they expect companies to take action on this as well. The third one is the, is the more operational one, is the financial drivers. So as demand for communication services increases, the, the, the energy required to, to provide those services is expected to grow as well. Um, and energy costs are already one of the top, top you know, expense categories for, for, um, for ICT sector companies. So we need to deploy strategies that, reduce, that increase energy efficiency um, you know, of, of the ICT. So this is not just a sustainability imperative, but it's also a business imperative. So with this in mind, the Green G Working Group, if you go to the next slide, um, we're working on, or we have been, we have published two white papers. The first one was released last year. Um, and what it did is it, it listed out a couple of things. One is the, it detailed the scale of the climate challenge. It talked about the key environmental sustainability aspects for ICT to consider. It talked about some of the key challenges for the ICT sector to decarbonize, and then also to support the decarbonization of other sectors. And then we also provided a clear call to action and recommendation for the ICT sector companies um, on the steps they need to take in order to reach net zero um, by 2050 or sooner. Um, the new paper that, that we just recently released, the one that I'm, I'm gonna talk about in some more detail, um, has kind of two key objectives. The first one is, you know, to provide an overview of the environmental sustainability KPIs for the ICT industry 
and its applicability to different 6G ecosystem components, um, such as RAN, core, cloud, uh, data centers, and, and also end user devices. We also look into supply chain and manufacturing um, as key environmental impact areas. And then what we have done is we have identified areas of potential research um, that, that is needed to develop a harmonized set of sustainability KPIs for benchmarking the different 6G ecosystem components. So if you go to the next slide, I'll go into a little bit more detail. So what we what we have what we have uh, understood or what we have pointed out in this paper is that while it's important for 6G to provide performance in terms of co coverage capacity, uh, latency, all, all of these uh, attributes that are going to enable transforming use cases um, for our society, it's also important that we find ways in which we do that while minimizing energy use and environmental footprint of, of these services. So what we do in this paper is we provide an overview of the currently available sustainability KPIs which apply to 6G ecosystems. Um, and, and we point that the environmental impacts are not limited again to greenhouse gas emissions, but we are also introducing environmental impact categories that are relevant within the different 6G infrastructure domains. Um, you know, 5G was designed with energy efficiency in mind. You know, we, we, we talk about 6G having, have, you know, 6G needing to be designed, manufactured and operated, keeping in mind the net zero uh, commitments of our industry uh, and, and the goals that we as humanity need to hit. The paper also identifies research requirements to develop harmonized set of KPIs uh, for measuring and benchmarking 6G ecosystem components. So if you go to the next slide, um, there is this really interesting table in the in the in the KPI white paper, um, and we introduce this concept of the different environmental impact categories that apply across the entire 6G ecosystem. It's important to note here that not all of the uh, not all of the ecosystem uh, components will have the same uh, or, or same significance uh, environmental impact so for example um, you know um, water footprint may be a, a materially more um, significant environmental impact for for data centers as as opposed to the ran um, right so so we have to take into account that this, these impacts are not equal across all of the 6G ecosystem components. Um, and also, while, while manufacturing and supply chain are not a ecosystem component, they are, they are common across all of the, they're common across the entire ecosystem. So, you know, when, when, when we were manufacturing ICT equipment and the upstream and the downstream transportation associated with that creates environmental impacts which need to be accounted for. Um, you know, the ITU standard for net zero uh, you know, requires us to take a whole value chain approach and looking at scope one, scope two, but also scope three emissions that happen in the supply chain. So it's important that we cover all of these topics in the white paper, which we do. So if you go to the next slide, um, you know, this goes into kind of the research area. So while the industry is aligned behind the North Star to reach net zero emissions, um, what the paper points out is that we need to develop uh, operational KPIs. KPIs that can be used by companies to measure the efficacy of their sustainability programs, um, energy efficiency, renewable energy, circular economy, um, water footprint reduction, um, those KPIs that they need to measure the efficacy of their sustainability programs as they work towards their sustainability uh, objectives. Um, we have also identified future areas of study to answer some of some really key questions like how how to effectively measure um, sustainability metrics from, from, for 6G from end-to-end from end -end communication services. Um, we've also um, you know, identified uh, future areas of study, that how do you partition energy um, consumption between core uh, data centers and clouds? Um, and then also, um, you know, when you have communication devices that are embedded within other equipment, like you know, robots, for example, or vehicles, how do you take out the specific sustainability metrics related to connectivity um, you, you know, within that entire, uh, within the overall equipment? So some really interesting uh, areas where we say future studies required. Um, so where are we going now? So if you go to the next slide, this is where the Green G Working Group is moving towards. So we have identified the environmental sustainability KPIs, or, or we're going to work on identifying environmental sustainability KPIs for RAN, core, cloud, end user devices, and manufacturing supply chain. 
the, the paper that we just published looked at what is available now, what gaps exist, and what's the, uh, what's the, uh, what's the future research needed. Now we're going to dig deeper, look at specific ecosystem components, and work collaboratively uh, within the Green G Working Group and outside to identify environmental KPIs specific to each of these ecosystem components. Um, again, our, our goal is to position North America as a leader in environmental sustainability for 6G. And what we really want is we want more participation. We want members to get involved, contribute more, and we want others who are not members to, to join us and, and really help us make this change for better. So that concludes my portion. I will pass it off back to Sarah, uh, who is going to lead a very interesting panel. Uh, so take it away, Sarah. All right, thanks, Bhushan. And I'll just go ahead and ask all of my panelists to turn on their webcams. And while they're doing that, I just want to make a note to the audience, this is a panel. And while I have some questions that I've prepared, I would be more than happy to have the panelists answer your questions. So feel free to use the uh, GoToWebinar tool to enter a question. I'll be keeping an eye on those as we go through this session, and we'll try to include some of your questions as well. So. Uh, please feel free to participate. All right, so let me start off by introducing our panelists. Uh, first, we have Karsten Bowman. And in his role as a solution architect at Schneider Electric, he's helping clients with their industrial IoT and sustainability initiatives in the commercial and industrial and data center markets that allow, uh, that allow to achieve greater resiliency achieve sustainability objectives and create economic benefits. Welcome, Karsten. Next up, we have Mimi Tam. Uh, in her current role as Senior Director of Engineering at Ericsson in Cradle Point, she's also a computer science professor at the University of Massachusetts and previously was the CTO and Head of Emerging Technologies and Innovation at Ericsson. She's been in the telecom and wireless engineering industry for over 38 years. Welcome, Mimi. Up next, we have Gagan Bhatti. Gagan is a senior standardization specialist where he is leading and driving Nokia's contributions to the Green G, as well as contributing to research and pre-standardization of 6G, including 3GPP, RAN1, and RAN2, as well as network and energy savings. Welcome, Gagan. Thank you. And, fi and finally, we have Simone Merlin. Uh, Dr. Simone Merlin is a Principal Systems Engineer and Manager at Qualcomm Technologies and currently is working on 5G research and development in the areas of extended reality optimizations, 5G private network automation, and integrated communications and sensing design. And welcome, Simone. All right, panel, so thanks for being here. I'm going to go ahead and kick off uh, with a question based off of some of the things that uh, Bhushan was talking about with the work that the Green G's done of trying to design KPIs for sustainability. So given all the work that we did to, as a working group to put together KPIs, how do we know that those KPIs make sense? And how did we test them in the public square and know in, in the public square and know that they're Effect, uh, that they reflect real societal and environmental needs. Uh, Karsten, why don't you why don't you go first? Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah, for having me on Tafushan and Colleen. Thank you so much for the great introduction. It's a pleasure and an honor to work with the Green Tree Working Group under the um, uh, 6G Alliance. And um, so, when you asked, you know, when do KPIs need to make sense? You know, and how do you test them? First of all, I think they do have to make sense in the in regards to they have to be relevant to the business. I think they have to be also simple in order to be able to be adopted. And you know, in case they are controversial, um, you know, which then allows us to review them, to refine them, and to reevaluate them. And I want to, you know, potentially they also should be very simple, you know, in order to uh, be implemented. And I want to give an example in the data center world. So about 10 years ago, or a little bit longer than that. You know, there were two KPIs initiated. One was called the PUE, the Power Utilization Effectiveness, and that was really relevant to the business because driving energy efficiency really lowered the operational expenditure significantly. And it really drove the entire data center industry to look for ways of how to become more efficient. A little bit later, but still about eight years ago or so, 
We also implemented uh, a KPI called the WUE, the Water Utilization Effectiveness. This was really important, but it wasn't really relevant to the business, so it didn't really mature, or wasn't really implemented or adopted. And I think this is a great example. And um, you know, so we we have for the data center industry as they're looking for now to include those like WUE because water and wastewater is becoming really critical. But they're looking even beyond this in energy and greenhouse gases. So you know, there are white papers out there. We've published them. You know, we're working on it. Um, you know, in order to help our customers to better understand, um, you know, in terms of the efficiency, greenhouse gas emissions, the water usage, the local ecosystems like land use and biodiversity. So these are all effects which are now becoming more critical to the business. And I think that's a good indicator that they are start making sense. And the big hyperscalers. The Googles, the Apples, the Amazons, the Facebooks, the Microsoft, so forth. They are driving these kind of new KPIs, and it makes sense to them, and it trickles down into the industry. So that's what I would say. How to? It needs to be relevant to the business. Otherwise, you know, they might make sense economically. I mean, sorry, uh, ecologically, but they may not necessarily make sense economically, and therefore, it's going to be a tough cookie. All right, Gagan, do you have any thoughts that you want to add on to that? Sure. Uh, thanks, Sarah, for the great introduction. And also, thanks as well to Bhushan and Colleen for their great presentation. I'm glad to be here in order to work uh, and contribute in Green G. Uh, great points by my uh, friend, Karsten. Uh, I would like to add one point to that. Um, although no KPI is perfect, however, we should thrive to create KPIs that are measurable, as well as provide clear differentiation among technologies. For example, between 5G and in future 6G. With that, we'll have clear differentiation and we can see the clear benefit of the technology. Yeah, I just wanted to add that point. No problem. Any other comments from our other panelists? I guess I have a couple of real quick comments in terms of uh, how to test these KPIs uh, in the public square. Um, several things came to mind. Uh, one is we can have some pilot programs. Uh, these pilot pro programs can be used to test the effectiveness of these KPIs. We can uh, always do a data analysis to make sure that uh, the, the KPIs we set out to, to meet or measure uh, are valid in terms of how um, the different communities and societies see them. We need continuous monitoring of these KPIs and continuous evaluation to make sure they're still relevant. Uh, we can use some kind of a participatory methods such as uh, surveys, uh, focus groups, or workshops to engage the different stakeholders in terms of making sure that these KPIs are um, all that are needed uh, from the different stakeholders. And then um, finally, we, we need to conduct um, impact and assessment as to what we do really has an impact on society and economic uh, um, environment as a whole. And, and then, of course, uh, having some feedback mechanism to make sure that people, uh, um, you know, exercise these KPIs, uh, what the, their uh, feelings are and what the results are, and have a feedback loop back to the people who implement them. That's all I have a few points in mind. Thank you. Yeah, great point, Mimi. Um, I love that you mentioned kind of the feedback loop and back into standards bodies and the folks that are working uh, in that area. So kind of related to that, um, Gagan, I want to direct the next question to you first. Uh, what sustainability-related KPIs will be important in the evolution towards the 6G RAN, and how can they be measured and monitored? Thanks, Sarah. It's a great question. Uh, we discussed this in our Green G KPI white paper as well. There are five environmental sustainability impact categories, as Bhushan mentioned earlier, relevant to each 6G domain. Uh, those are energy efficiency, greenhouse gas emissions, water usage, recycled waste, land and biodiversity. In the case of RAN, energy consumption is the main source of greenhouse gas emissions. So for RAN, energy efficiency KPI is quite important. It is measured in bits per joule relative to the time of the day at the base station. Uh, also as per one study, 80% of the RAN sites carry only approximately 20% of all the traffic. It is an eye opener, right? These low loaded sites consume significant amount of power and therefore it is important to measure and minimize energy consumption at those sites. 
there is a lot of good work ongoing currently in the research and standardization world for 5G advance. For example, 3GPP network energy savings in release 18. Uh, to move to the second part of the question about the network operational tools, right? So there are several network operational tools that can help to monitor the network traffic and energy consumption of a site at a specific times during the day. So uh, it is clearly possible to do that. And to conclude on this, uh, it is not only important to measure and monitor those KPIs, but also by doing that, it also provides the identification of opportunities to further optimize the energy efficiency. Great, thanks, Gagan. Uh, Simone, do you have any thoughts to add to this? Maybe I can just add a, a different point of view also from the um, social economical um, point of view that there are other uh, KPIs beyond say, power consumption that can be important for the SDG goals. And uh, while the run is a kind of very technical aspect of the of the system, but it can, we can still evaluate it in terms of whether it's able to meet certain goals, such as being um, uh, able to uh, provide ubiquitous coverage to uh, be able to meet and lower digital, digital divide, um, whether the, uh, the cost of access is low. So again, to, to be able to provide more uh, coverage and more easily, and that can meet certain uh, requirements and certain of the SDG goals. So um, I just wanted to add that beyond the power consumption and strictly technical aspects, there can be other KPIs that are more relevant for the uh, social economic growth in general. Great, thanks. Uh, so next, next question. What are the key areas where 6G will have the most significant impact on societal growth? And how will it address current social challenges such as inequality and access to education? So I'll turn this over uh, to our, our panelists from the SEN Working Group. Uh, Mimi, why don't you take this first? Sure, thank you, Sarah. Um, so we know 6G is still in R&D phase. It may take uh, several years before it becomes widely available. So I want to be very careful in saying that there are some potential areas where 6G can have a significant impact on societal growth and address some of the current social challenges. But these are potentials and not guarantees. It's really up to us to make sure that these potentials uh, can materialize in a positive and beneficial manner. So having said that, uh, there are several things that um, we can uh, talk about in addressing um, uh, the the uh, impacts on societal growth and, and economic growth. One is that we know 6G is um, uh, having much faster, more reliable connectivity capacity, uh, more so than the current 5G. So with data speeds that are potentially reaching up to one terabyte per second, this could lead to faster and more reliable internet connections, particularly in rural and remote areas. And that what that will give us is certainly um, much better access to online education for underserved communities and other digital resources, especially for people living in those areas. For Internet of Things, um, as we know, 6G is expected to support a much larger number of devices. And um, uh, these are connected devices and sensors and with much faster data transfer rate than 5G. So this could enable more advanced and interconnected systems, uh, especially in healthcare, like remote surgery, transportation, uh, smart cities. In other words, this can benefit um, uh, and widen really the scope of uh, uh, in Internet of Things. The other thing is on uh, virtual and augmented reality. 6G can support a VR, AR, and XR, which could transform the way we learn and work, for example, uh, VR can provide immersive educational experiences and allow students to explore pretty complex concepts visually and also in a hands-on way, uh, regardless of their physical uh, uh, location. This could uh, certainly help to address inequality in education and providing uh, high quality educational experiences to people uh, who lack this access um, or access to traditional classroom settings. The other area is AIML. 
So 6G could enable more advanced AI ML applications by providing faster and more reliable data transfer rates. Uh, this could include uh, many things like autonomous vehicles, remote learning, uh, robotics, healthcare, and, and many other things that you can think of, or things that you haven't thought of yet. In terms of security, with the increasing number of connected devices uh, and applications, cybersecurity uh, is becoming a very critical concern. So 6G uh, could potentially provide enhanced security features to protect against cyber cyber attacks of, of all kinds, based on the high capacity and, and all of the uh, uh, better and improved capacity um, uh, supporting supporting the security um, measures. Um, so improved automation is another thing we can benefit from because 6G support much better performance in all sorts of ways. So we can expect automation in many things like public transportation, robotics in assisting uh, things like uh, caregiving and household chores uh, even. In terms of environmental sustainability, 6G could support um, initiatives like um, smart cities deployed in many more cities than today. There are only a, a small percentage that has smart cities these days, but that could really help to reduce uh, energy consumption and waste, uh, address social challenges such as climate change, which disproportionately, uh, sorry about that, affects low income and marginally um, uh, provided uh, communities. Healthcare is also another area that could be benefited. Energy and environment, which Bushan ha had suggested, uh, things that could be benefited. Entertainment is another area. So 6G can provide new opportunities for immersive and interactive inter entertainment experiences, uh, such as augmented reality, um, uh, virtual reality. You can have much more exciting experiences, even playing games, right? So last but not least, uh, in financial area, uh, 6G um, with all these capacities can really help secure financial transactions, leading to uh, much more efficient um, uh, and transparent financial systems. Um, and um, one other thing that I could think of is, is manufacturing, of course. Could, 6G can enable, uh, as we said earlier, advanced interconnected manufacturing systems, and that could improve efficiency and reduce costs. So having said all of that, and uh, it's not something that we don't know of already, but listing them out uh, can show you how 6G can really help enhance our quality of life and um, uh, improve trust and all of that. However, it's also important to note that access to technology alone is not enough to address all these challenges. Um, there are larger systemic issues that need to be addressed to ensure that everyone has that equal opportunity. So it is important uh, to approach the R&D of 6G with the holistic perspective uh, that cons considers its potential impact on all aspects of society and in a way that prioritizes social and environmental sustainability that does not uh, exacerbate existing inequalities. Great, thanks Mimi. And Simone, do you have anything that you wanna to add to that or any particular areas that you feel passionate about on this on this topic? Yeah, I think Mimi did a, an excellent summary of all the, the main key points. Just wanted to, to stress how um, we do expect NextG to really provide new opportunities, also in creating new services. Like and we mentioned, to extend the reality, for instance, that can create uh, new services, new job opportunities, new opportunities for improving uh, workers' training, which can further um, improve the, the economic growth. So, um, and so that, that 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 to me, it's an it's an important aspect. And, and the other one that Mimi mentioned as well is the improving really the efficiency of the entire production and distribution and consumption system uh, by having uh, enabling a very uh, detailed monitoring of all the processes. And I think that that is going to have um, a big impact on how the, the entire production and distribution and consumption system will um, could improve, and hence reduce the impact on the environment. Great, Thank, thanks so much, uh, Mimi and Simone. Um, so switching switching gears a little bit, um, the role of the data center 
in the development of 5G and 6G is becoming more and more relevant as the number, or as instead of dedicated hardware, we're seeing a shift for many of the different functions to move towards software defined and running on standard IoT equipment. Uh, this spans from data processing, storage, and necessary networks, uh, in the necessary networks to, to transport it. Uh, what is the data industry, data center industry doing to become more sustainable? Uh, Karsten, can you can you take this one for us? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Sarah. So at first, you know, I think the data center industry has changed a lot, right? Certainly in the last, you know, 10, 15 years, we've seen a gigantic shift from more bigger enterprise data centers to cloud, these large development of hyperscalers which also by economy of scale have the ability to implement technologies in a way they ultimately need to be more energy efficient and more sustainable using different construction methodologies and so forth. We also see that the power density per square foot measured inside a white space of a data center has dramatically increased. Uh, we're seeing now shifts from you know, uh, air cooled to liquid cooling, which is again more efficient um, and therefore, you know, the heat can be removed as these servers become more in uh, uh, dense and more intense. Um, and I think, as I mentioned earlier, you know, this very effective KPI, this uh, power utilization effectiveness has really helped to drive down the efficiency. And of course, we also have seen that the data center market has pretty much exploded in terms of the amount of capacity that's available as everything is digitizing. We're talking about smart manufacturing, smart um, you know, cities, uh, smart uh, healthcare, and you know all these different other applications and gaming and you know watching Netflix at home. So there's more and more data being generated every time. The old um, you know um, prediction is still true that 90% of all the data that is being available, digital data that's available today, 90% of that has been generated in the last two years. And it just continues to grow like this. So that's an enormous amount of growth. And therefore, you know, looking for uh, becoming more efficient, more sustainable is a key component. And I think what the industry has done really well is like, if we would have not done energy efficiency measurements in the past already, we would consume about quadruple as much energy in the entire data center industry today compared to how it was operated 10 years ago, how they were operated 10 years ago. So I think this is really, really interesting. And if, of course, you know, the economic benefits need to be there. So the cost is really a big driver. And now we see that sustainability is becoming a new priority. Um, you know, and it's driven again, as I mentioned earlier, by the hyperscalers and it trickles down to the other data center and large data center operators. And I think what we will see also, uh, what we already have seen already, is that many of those larger scale data centers, they actually acquiring you know, renewable energy to power their data center. It may not be on site. Actually, the most of it is off site through power purchase agreements or virtual power uh, purchase agreements. Let's say from a wind farm or a solar farm, and they're offsetting the amount of energy they consume in the data center with renewable energy generation. So therefore that scope two emissions, you know, becomes more sustainable. Now people can argue about this. And because of that, we are now seeing also that companies are looking or data center companies looking not only in sourcing renewable energy on an annualized basis, but they want to do it on a 24 by seven operation. That means every IT element that's been processed, data that's been processed, stored uh, and transported on a 24 by seven basis is always coming or has been powered by renewable and uh, you know, sustainable energy resources. Um, so I think that's a, a really uh, interesting element. It's the whole, it's kind of like the holy grail. How are we going to do this on a 24 by seven area? We have to shift IT loads, you know, and where, where the sustainable power is available. And then the last thing, you know, also, I mean, not actually the two last things to scope one and scope three, right? So where there's a lot of conversation right now, how do we um, change these backup generation assets, you know, which are used in order to um, support the operation, something if something were to happen from the utility company. And they're frequently like 99% is all diesel generators. So it's a big conversation right now to change diesel generation to on-site to more sustainable, become more grid interactive, um, uh, utilizing other resources. You know, hydrogen is a new energy storage and, uh, 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 um, element, you know, that's been uh, very closely um, talked about. 
right now. And then, of course, the big driver right now we see in many conversations with um, data center customers and operators is the entire value chain, the upstream and downstream of scope three, right? So am I buying a product or a service, you know, that actually has from a life cycles assessment, you know, a, it's more sustainable compared to in the past, nobody, nobody looked at it. We just bought the best product for the best price, you know, the best performance. And now we see that's actually changing. We also see that um, site location, so where these large data centers are being built, they're not only evaluated by cheap power, good network capacity, and maybe tax incentives for the IT equipment, but we're also seeing right now like, okay, how can we develop this asset with in the most sustainable way with the least disturbance of land, you know, and um, you know, empowering with renewable resources by having access directly to renewable resources rather than I have a data center in California and I buy a wind farm, you know, energy production from somewhere else out of state. Um, so these are all elements uh, we're looking into right now, the customers are looking into, and we're helping them to do that. So a lot is, has changed and a lot more is continues to change and will change. Great answer. Um, Mimi, are there any thoughts that you'd like to add on to this? Um, perhaps just a few. I think uh, Karsten have already covered quite a good number of them. Uh, but in terms of where the data center industry has made significant efforts uh, to become more sustainable, um, other than them being more energy efficient, um, going towards the circular economy model, carbon offsetting, water conservation, um, things of that sort, I'll add a couple. So many data centers today are actually designed and built to meet a so-called green building standards. A couple that I can name, one is a LEAD, short for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, and the other is BREEAM, B-R-E-E-A-M, short for Building Research Establishment Environmental Assessment Method. These standards uh, set guidelines for energy efficiency, water usage, and sustainable building materials. So I see these kind of building standards as really a, a, a way forward for a lot of data center um, um, model, how they really build their data center. The other area uh, is uh, regarding standards and certifications. Data center operators are seeking third party certification these days, because uh, such as Energy Star, which has been around for quite some time. ISO 14001 also has been quite some time. And there are um, they, they want to uh, go with some sort of a green greed um, uh, mechanism to demonstrate that their commitment to sustainability and environmental responsibility is there. So by way of these kind of certifications. Um, so so uh, standards and certifications does have a, uh, its place um, in, in establishing these kind of um, efforts to make sure, yes, we have that effort. So carbon footprint, renewable energy uh, procurement, uh, wastewater recovery, all those things were already mentioned. One thing about data center, um, um, how they built it, also relates to something called the modular data center, that more and more data centers are building um, in a modular fashion. They're designed to be, again, more energy efficient, uh, more scalable than traditional data centers. Uh, it's also more flexible in terms of location, where you, where you want to place them. You can hold it anywhere you want. Uh, it's small, and that's how data centers are more and more trying to explore whether they can do it. Lastly is um, uh, employee education. I think it's important to for data center operators to make sure that they educate their employees to be really aware on the importance of sustainability, what are the best practices, and to encourage them to adopt these uh, sustainability measures in their their home, their workplace, um, in in wherever they visit, to to be well aware that this is an important issue. So uh, this can include really reducing energy usage, conserving water, and re recycling waste. These are all um, acronyms or terms that we use uh, a lot. But whether we really put them into practice um, on an individual basis is something that we need to to have more education on. Thank you, Sarah. Yep. Sarah, yeah, if you don't mind, Sarah, I just want to add one more point if that's okay. <clears throat> you know, uh, as Mimi just mentioned, you know, like having like lead green buildings, you know, the data center is being built sustainably, like concrete and steel, that's all important, you know, um, and yet it's a fraction of the sustainability impact in the way a data center has been operated, 
you know. So you can have the most green building and inefficiently operate your data center. You know, it's it's kind of like you know the impact of the operational efficiency is significantly you know by a large scale more relevant to actually the the building of the building. The building is going to be there for 20, 30 years, hopefully, right? Um, but the operation is really, um, you know, driving the overall envelope sustainability envelope on scope one, two, and three. So I'm not neglecting it; it's important. But operational is like that's where the low-hanging fruits are, right? Yeah, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, Simone, I'd love to hear some more from you. Um, how can academic and research institutions contribute to the development of 6G technology and ensure that it's aligned with societal and economical needs as well as environmental needs? Yeah, I think, um, I think probably the first step is for this institution to make themselves aware and familiar with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, it's a relatively new set of goals um, defined in 2015. So um, I think it would be important that these goals are uh, embedded in the, in the in the design process for process from the beginning. So the uh, the ideation of new uh, technologies and new uh, solutions should should start from from these goals. Um, and so these institutions should also educate you know, the researchers to um, to follow these goals and keep it in mind in their uh, design process. Um, another aspect I think is important is to uh, keep increasing the, the collaboration with the industry, and and that's um, and that's how I think it should be a two-way conversation, of course. Um, so that's how the academic environment can learn of why certain solutions didn't work, why do we still have these gaps in, uh, in sustainability and in uh, economic growth. So what are really the either technical or business aspects that uh, can be improved. Um, and on the other hand, the, the, um, the academic and research environment can um, help bridge uh, the, the gaps across different industries and provide guidance uh, for long-term solutions. So I think the, the synergies are, are really needed. Um, and I would say finally, the, um, the the outcome of the research and this uh, new development should also be effectively fed to to policymakers so that they can drive um, they can drive you know the important decisions uh, in a science driven manner. Uh, and I think it was mentioned earlier the importance of spectrum allocations, but also other decision on which technologies should be incentivized. Um, and that's somehow also one of the goals of the white paper that we were writing to educate also policymakers and um, and try to uh, to set these goals. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's my take on it. Thanks. I, and, and Mimi, did you have any thoughts that you'd like to add on top of what Simone had said? Uh, yes. So. Uh, academia and research institutions are not like industry in a way that they're not profit oriented or entirely profit oriented and always look out for the bottom line. So they have their own unique functions. They they a lot of times conduct research research in areas where industry is not just not going to touch, right? So uh, a couple of things that I can think of is that um, they can conduct uh, R and D on studies that are related to how 6G can impact on wildlife. So you can't make money out of that, but this is important. You know, how 6G networks on wildlife, particularly on birds and insects, uh, which are pretty sensitive to electromagnetic radiation. Uh, this may not exist, but you don't know. Uh, this, this is something that, uh, from a network perspective, there are areas that, how is it going to um, uh, um, present any uh, potential uh, positive or negative impact or effects, uh, and then they have to develop strategies to mitigate them. I see that the academic and research institutions, their role is really to pick up uh, gaps in areas where the industry may not really necessarily uh, want to pick up on because they don't have a product that they think uh, is marketable. Uh, so, um, so that that is they are very it's a very important in, to function that way. 
the other area that I think Simone has mentioned is policy development. So uh, they have uh, a strong voice in making sure that uh, whatever they came out of uh, has some um, influence in government policy and how the deployment uh, should go in, in a sense that it's not going to be negatively um, uh, impacting any any area. So um, in terms of the regulatory framework. So that's an important conversation to have between them as, as having a strong voice and, and the policymakers. They also have a, a very good um, uh, position in engaging the public um, because they, they are purely uh, uh, academia. They don't necessarily have all the goals uh, and purposes that industry has. So they can help to ensure that the technology is, is developed in a way that it really aligns with the societal and economic uh, needs. Um, those are the few things I'd like to highlight. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you. Um, we had a question come in specifically for Goggin, and he is having technical difficulties. <laughs> so let's see. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take take uh, take that question and make it a bit more broad and pose it to kind of the rest of the group, and then when Goggin rejoins us, he can give us his perspective. But um, really. We're trying to, the, the question that came in was to give a few examples around where we can have larger improvements um, around measurable uh, KPIs between different technologies, and, and the question was specifically for the RAN. So I'll pose that maybe a bit broader uh, until Gagan can rejoin us and just say, maybe, what are the top two or three techniques that the industry should investigate? Oh, there he is. Perfect. So, <laughs> all right. So. So Gagan, this question's for you. What are the top three techniques the industry should investigate to improve the efficiency of the RAN? Yeah, uh, thanks, Sarah. Thanks for the great question. Actually, um, sorry for the technical difficulties as well on my side. Uh, this is a great question. Uh, and we, uh, fortunately, there is a rich list of uh, technologies or techniques that industry can investigate to improve the efficiency of domains such as RAN, core network and user device. And in a broad perspective, we could divide those into three innovation methodologies, um, component technology innovations, improving the technology used in components that can lead to significant improvements in the efficiency. For example, in the RAN, uh, better power amplifiers could be used. And for the end user uh, communication device, low power processors, efficient batteries that can reduce power consumption and improves efficiency. Uh, for the architectural innovation is the next. Uh, further improvements in the architecture that can also lead to significant improvements in efficiency. Uh, for example, using advanced signal processing techniques such as uh, MIMO muting or advanced interference calculation. It helps in uh, improving the energy efficiency in the RAN domain, as an example. Uh, the third, which is more uh, or very important aspect as well, uh, which is operational framework innovations. Making changes to the operational practices uh, can also lead to the improvements in efficiency. For example, uh, implementing techniques uh, such as discontinuous transmission, reception, uh, and various sleep modes uh, can reduce power consumption during periods of low traffic. Uh, for data centers, uh, smart energy conservation methods uh, such as uh, remote diagnostics, those uh, could be very helpful. So in order to conclude on this, as well as uh, I would like to mention, uh, we are going to discuss all these in our in very details in our future um, white paper or upcoming white paper, domain specific white papers. So for all the viewers, uh, I would like to say uh, stay tuned. Uh, we'll be having uh, more information on this coming. Great, thanks, thanks, Gagan. Um, I want to open that question up to the rest of the panelists too. Not just the RAN, but the, are there any specific techniques that you would like to recommend that the broader industry focus on to uh, to make improvements around sustainability? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, from a data center's perspective, you know, um, as I mentioned early on, you know, like utilizing renewable energy resources on a twenty-four by seven method which requires more digital data in order in fast networks to actually enable this technology. Stop using any water, right? So no water usage in the future. And Gagan just mentioned it, you know, so we see we're entering the age of autonomous 
in the data centers. So we will use fewer resources utilizing uh, predictive analytics, you know, like AI and machine learning, uh, which, you know, once we use fewer resources, we need to dispatch less trucks, you know, fix it and roll it out um, and, um, you know, becoming more efficient, more effective. So I think these are a few things we actually can do to become more sustainable. I can add a couple too, actually. Um, I find that we can do a lot more virtualization. Uh, so network virtualization uh, can allow you know, logical networks to run on a single physical network. We can do more of that. We can use AI ML to, to do uh, optimized network more. Um, we can go with small cells and headnets. Headnets are heterogeneous networks. So small cells are low powered, uh, lower powered and uh, could be deployed in areas where there's high traffic uh, uh, demand. We can use more of that. And also heterogeneous networks, uh, you can incorporate different kinds of uh, uh, frequencies cells and and as opposed to macro cells, uh, small cells can improve efficiency and, and coverage. The other thing is we can maybe do more on the energy harvesting area. We can harvest energy, which is a technique to um, um, uh, get power, um, you know, to support end devices using renewable energy that is something such as solar and kinetic energy so that that area energy harvesting i think can be uh, really further explored and take advantage of and lastly is do a lot more network optimization and um, uh, virtualization uh, also with open ran in mind as well open ran, ran although it's not directly um, related but i think it could help in terms of making sure that all the vendors can work together and uh, indirectly could help uh, as uh, part of um, um, a, a technique to improve the efficiency of the of the ran the core the whole end-to-end -end, uh, network all right simone i'll give you a chance to answer to pass <laughs> yeah the uh, i think all the uh, the great points were made. I just wanted to to add maybe just um, a point that uh, although it's not uh, directly related to RAN, but um, the devices that are attached to RAN as well, and they they, they contribute to the overall energy consumption uh, in the in the big scheme of things. So making sure that the RAN is designed in such a way that all the devices that are attached to RAN can also operate in a very um, power saving mode that that will help the overall goal of reducing energy consumption of the of the system so all right so for everyone listening i think we heard some some great recommendations there uh, we're, we're drawing close to time for the the panel session so i have one more question for everyone and i'll just say you know give us maybe a one to two minute answer on your thoughts but i'd like you to think about you know, 10 years into the future, even even five years into the future when we have 6G. And if we have the ideal sustainable 6G, uh, what does that look like to you? What would you like to see um, in our in our first rollouts of, of the next generation? Uh, let's see, um, I'm gonna just go in order that you're on my screen. So I'll go to you first. Was it me? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay, very good. Okay, I didn't, make, didn't get that. Um, yeah, so look, um, we see starting right now a shift to the edge, right? So we you know, went from enterprise to cloud. I'm not saying cloud's going away, right? But there's more and more data center capacity being built out at the edge, right? Closer to where the data has been consumed and generated. That will help to avoid sending a lot of traffic across, you know, multiple networks and data centers. Um, so in order to avoid replication and so forth. So local edge, you know, or, you know, edge applications, we say that that's number one. Number two, as I mentioned, 24 seven sustainable energy generation. Number two, uh, three, the age of the autonomous, right? Fewer resources, predictive analytics, you know, so in order to become more efficient, um, closer collaboration with utility companies, instead of just being an off taker of utility, on-site power generation, including like, hydrogen and other sustainable resources. And maybe in 10 years, by 2030, we may already see the first small modular nuclear reactors, you know, being directly, you know, um, adjacent to a, a large data center. So instead of having centralized uh, electricity generation, which then needs to be transmitted and distributed, you need to do it more on site. Now, of course, it might be a controversial topic, 
but at least you know it doesn't have any kind of greenhouse gas. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, you know, hydrogen we will scale everything at speed faster. Uh, so from the time you know a, a new data center capacity needs to come online, um, the construction uh, and Mimi mentioned earlier, prefabrication is a big component in this. You know, uh, so I think these are the kind of changes we'll see. You know, shift to the edge, sustainable energy predictive analytics, you know, to use free resources, scaling at speed, and more on-site renewable and sustainable power generation in conjunction with utility companies. All right, great. Uh, Simone, you're next on my list. <laughs> What's your ideal 6G look like? Well, I think going back to one of the points that were made earlier, um, the, the 6G, 6G and XG should be designed with um, some specific goals in mind. Uh, and the uh, sustainability goals and the uh, economic needs and the societal needs. So I hope that the design will, will, will start with those goals in mind and then we'll be really focused on uh, on the needs. And, and so it should be an end-to-end -end design where all the different components of the systems are designed from the start with that goal in mind, um, which doesn't always happen. It's different components get designed uh, separately, and then the um, the overall goal may not always be met. So that's, that's my high level take. All right, great, uh, Gagan. What what does your ideal six G look like? Thanks, Sarah. So uh, considering five G is still being deployed right now, right? I anticipate uh, that in six G. Uh, or 2030, let's say, uh, we should be entering the first phase of 6G, where sustainability to be the fundamental principle of the design of 6G, of the design of technology. So at that time, we should also have a clear matrix available to measure sustainability. The networks would be designed to support wide range of applications and services that promote sustainability like uh, smart agricultural, smart cities, and smart transportation. So uh, in short, I'm being really uh, ambitious here uh, with the expectation of both uh, sustainable 6G as well as uh, 6G for sustainability. Thank you. I like that. <laughs> All right, and Mimi, you, you get the last words here. What does your ideal 6G look like? Well, you all said all the good points. Uh, I I think uh, having set, uh, everything that's already mentioned, uh, I, I just have a couple of things to add. Uh, first of all, 6G is really not that far away. Um, my ideal scenario, and I'm not talking about a utopia, uh, you know, it, it's not going to be perfect, of course, but I am hoping that 6G could be really designed with digital inclusion in mind, meaning that we want to ensure that the connectivity is available to um, if not everyone, most most people who really can can should to get uh, a six G in terms of you know faster broadband capacity and all that, that they are included. So digital inclusion is is a scenario that um, I'm hoping that it will materialize. It's not just a hope. Uh, the the second thing is we we can expect that there's a massive connectivity with all the devices that are coming on the scene. Uh, there will be um, um, billions and billions of devices and sensors connected. So how are we going to achieve this? Maybe we can achieve it through um, uh, advanced antenna technologies, um, such as a holographic beamforming, deployment of uh, uh, low orbit satellites and, and drones and, and things of that sort. But we would be using all of these mechanisms to provide connectivity to anyone who wants connectivity. Um, the other thing is uh, uh, energy efficiency. We talked about energy efficiency in up times, right? But 6G, when it comes to the scene, I really hope that we can achieve extreme energy efficiency, meaning that we're using extremely low levels of energy, uh, including using renewable sources and innovative power saving techniques uh, to, in, very important to minimize environmental impact, negative impact. So to minimize it, not to totally you know, eliminate it, that may be an impossibility, but we could leverage the use of uh, nanotechnology to reduce energy requirement um, of wireless communication or or use nanotechnologies to perhaps you know send send medic medicine into our bloodstreams and all of that that replaces um electricity or any other uh, energies that uh, would be used in place of it 
So these are the few things that I may add in terms of uh, um, ideal scenarios, and th I think they're achievable. All right. Well, great. Thank you so much, Mimi. Thank you so much to all of the panelists for your fantastic answers here today. Uh, with that, that's going to conclude our, our panel section for this. And up next, I'm going to pass it off to Michaela and Jeremy so that they can give us some closing thoughts on this session as well as some call to actions. So thanks again, panelists. Uh, this has been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah. Hello, my name is Jeremy Naser, Vice Chair of the Societal and Economic Needs Working Group. As you heard today, ensuring that societal, economic, and environmental needs are in full focus for the wireless industry is challenging and something that requires a large, cohesive, and strategic effort. Given the pace of technology, the next generation of connectivity is expected to greatly enhance the access to information and provide ways of interacting with our surroundings that we can only dream of. This capability must be accessible by all, and we have the unique opportunity to start prioritizing this now to make certain it is addressed during the creation of 6G. By being proactive, we can take steps that will improve each and everyone's quality of life while balancing the environmental impact in North America. Areas such as affordability, accessibility, and data privacy are key to a free, open, and thriving society and need to be part of the discussion now, not just an afterthought. Thank you all for your attention and participation today. I'll now turn it over to Michaela. Thank you very much, Jeremy, and thank you everyone for um, attending this webinar. I'm really uh, happy that uh, we went through a very important agenda. And uh, just to um, close the, uh, the webinar, I would like to uh, bring a few call to actions. Um, it's absolutely imperative that the members of the uh, um, 6G Next G Alliance will continue to be very active as well as provide input into the vision to move forward the things that we have heard from the panel that we want to achieve uh, so one number one very important to all the members to contribute actively uh, to the working groups Second, I think uh, it's something that may have not been um, discussed uh, at length, but it's very important to uh, make sure that we continue a very um, good private and public relationship and build upon that and make sure that um, governments around the world and especially in North America, obviously, uh, are on board with uh, what we're trying to achieve. And uh, third, I would like to... invite um, everyone, uh, actually any organization that um, is attending this Web the Alliance, it's active. and um, it's again very important to increase the, yeah, the number of uh, organizations that speak out on the sustainability as well as the societal. And with that, I would like to um, close and thank you again for everyone attending as well as for uh, organizers and uh, panelists and yeah. our um, working group um, chairs for their remarks. Thank you very much.